Hi there, welcome to another video. Hopefully you can hear me okay uh, and, and it's not so echoey. This is our machine gun dugout and I thought I'd use it as um, the, somewhere to sit to talk to you about some of the questions you've been asking uh, when we've asked if there are any questions. So uh, if you're a patron uh, particularly, please do feel free to ask questions and we'll try and do some research, find a little bit about them if we can't just answer it quickly. Uh, this is a selection of questions that have been asked over the past few months. Hopefully we'll try and do it a little bit more regularly, so try and do something monthly if there are enough questions forthcoming. And uh, you know, I'll try and answer them as best I can. So we've got five questions in today's video. Um, the first of which is about muzzle attachments. These on the front of the gun. Uh, this is the most common, uh, but, it's, but it's the latest. So somebody asks, you know, what's the difference? Well, what we've got is this first pattern muzzle, muzzle attachment, the cone. Uh, so so the, the, the cage itself doesn't really change. There's some slightly different marks, uh, but the cage itself doesn't really change. So what we've got is we've got the Mark I cone, and this is the, this is the cone at the front uh, that, um, you know, that, that, that comes off the front of it. Uh, it you know, it's sort of the, it, the disc fits on the back face of that. Um, uh, you know, nothing much more to say. So that's the Mark One. You've then got the Mark Two. Now the difference between these two uh, is that you know, when you're facing the enemy, the most likely bit to uh, be exposed to enemy fire is the muzzle attachment and its surrounding um, piece of the barrel casing there. So they armoured it to make sure that, uh, at, that any rounds incoming would not only be protected by the thicker um, piece of metal there, but also the slope. So it would, sh it would sh uh, fire off the, any bullets that would hit it would shear off. Now I've never seen a damaged one. If you've ever seen a damaged one, do let me know. Uh, that would be really fascinating. But yeah, th this is what then appears on the majority of guns that are in existence today. This is earlier, uh, but it, it, it seems that from March 1916, the list of changes uh, made the change that introduced the Mark II, and then that's what exists for the rest of the period. What you do see uh, in the Second World War and after though, is it being fitted um, with something like this. Now this is the Eliminator Flash and Blast Deflector. It fits over the muzzle attachment. It's not something that replaces it. So on the front of the gun, it fits over it. It's a bit tight on that one. Uh, but then through this hole, through this hole is where you put your split pin to keep it on. Now this is a particularly interesting uh, flash eliminator because it's made out of two pieces. You've got a seam, a welding seam around the middle of there. Now those two pieces, if you can imagine that cut in half, so let me do that for you. Um, what you have then is the blast deflector piece. Now we don't have one of those in the collection at the moment, um, so so if you know of one, please just let us know. But this this half was introduced first, and it merely defects blast from the ground to stop dust uh, and you know getting over the gun, but also giving away your position. And then the uh, dust and sand. So then the flash eliminator piece that goes on the front of that stops the flash. Be of, of the muzzle attachment because this bit, you know, this is where all the gases come out and obviously the, the, the flash of, of the um, firing takes place as well. I've picked up the blank firing one there, confusingly. Uh, pick this one up again. So all, all of the gases and pressure come out of, come out of here, uh, the excess gases, so it's quite visible uh, from the side and uh, to some extent from the front, but ma mainly from the side, and, and you don't want that from the side because if you're in the gun position next to it, it's ruining your night vision for a start um, because you can just see the flash over here, but also it's gonna give that gun position away from the flank. So you put one of these over it and it hides and it makes that actually all of the uh, flash is visible from the front. And if you're in front of the gun, you're in a bad space anyway. If it's elevated in an indirect fire position, you're gonna see less of it and it's gonna uh, hide the, the, the visual signature of the, uh, of the gun. So that's what you put over. Now I picked this up confusingly a moment ago. This is the blank firing attachment and we've got a special video on that one that you can go and watch about how we adjust this. But this effectively is solid. You know, nothing can come through there. So it uses all of the gas from that to, to recoil the weapon um, and, and doesn't allow anything to fire forward. So actually an intrinsically safe blank firing attachment, unlike some on the light machine guns that have like crosshairs to, to split wooden bullets or there's paper wadding or something comes out of a gun, nothing can come out of the front of this one for the Vickers. So intrinsically safe by design. Uh, great to peep. Uh, know it. Now there are some other trials, uh, flash um, muzzle attachments, 
So cylindrical shapes, uh, some of the different countries around the world that bought the Vickers had their own sort of type of muzzle attachment that suited the ammunition they were using but effectively the muzzle, muzzle attachment is there to ensure that the the the, re the gases of the of the firing of the ammunition are kept and used to recoil the machine gun so this is fundamentally critical um, you can have overpowered ammunition and recoil it without the muzzle attachment uh, but certainly you know the, the, that means your ammunition is very very powerful so you, the, the muzzle attachment is there and is needed to be able to fire the Vickers fully automatic. So I hope that's of use and we'll move on to the, to the second question. Now our second question is one related to inert ammunition and what are the right heads uh, to use when making inert? Now these are the inert, um, you know, inert rounds that we've made in the collection or we've purchased in. Um, we These are probably purchased in actually by the looks of it because uh, we normally cut down the blank uh, that we've used in our firing demonstrations. But what we've got is a Cupra Nickel, uh, this, this uh, you know, white, white metal shiny uh, head there, bullet, and uh, a brass or a gun metal one. Now, from what we can work out, and I've just had a quick uh, read into uh, Labette's book on 303 ammunition and also a look through the Small Arms Committee minutes, there were obviously some issues with Cooper and Nickel ammunition and accuracy, um, and you know, the, uh, the corrosion that it was causing in gun barrels because it actually is uh, subject, subject to uh, discussion for the Small Arms Committee from at least 1917, so actually predating Small Arms Committee, uh, the Munitions Design Committee Small Arms Section. Uh, from 1917, and it's still there in the 1930s. It's a topic of discussion. You know, accuracy issues or metallic fouling caused by Cupro nickel uh, casings, but they're there. And it seems that according to Labette, they were there from 1910 onwards when the Mark VII ammunition came into service. So, you know, th th this certainly isn't wrong to use for any period, uh, but it seems to be very dominant from 1917 onwards. Then you have the brass or the um, gun metal ammunition, and that seems to uh, exist from a similar period, certainly correct uh, to in the Second World War, and this is what we find readily available now. You know, when we're re uh, using our inert, I think we're currently using PPU uh, manufactured heads, and they're a brass, bright brass color, so that's what goes in ours. I suppose what would be um, wrong is to see a mix like this, because ammunition is generally batched up. So if you've got everything the same, uh, it will certainly look much more accurate than some of the belts we have. Uh, and, and certainly these have all come out of a, a charger for a rifle um, in the collection. So it would look more accurate to have them all the same, um, nice and uniform as the military like it. Uh, doesn't always happen, of course. But yeah, so yeah, both seem to be correct. Lots of discussion from 1917 onwards about the Cooper and Nickel, uh, but the gun metal seems to be existing from about that sort of period as well. Our third question is whether guns and tripods were always kept together. Now, the, the example I'm showing you is a Nepalese Vickers machine gun, so Nepalese contract or Nepalese uh, package. And the reason I'm showing you this uh, behind those range finders there is because it... They are matched in this case. The gun is N4 uh, for Nepal, Nepal number four, and the tripod is Nepal number 104, so 104. And th this was such a small batch that they were matched. However, what's apparent is that isn't the case with any, you know, anything else really. You do sometimes see photographs of tripods and guns with numbers painted upon them and that seems to indicate the subsection or the gun in the section that that belongs to not necessarily the fact that the gun and tripod should be used together clearly some tripods and guns fit each other easier because of their wear uh, and the pins sometimes fit some but not others we certainly have that in the collection but other than this Nepalese gun we've not seen uh, any evidence to suggest that guns and tripods should always be matched. They do sometimes have the numbers painted upon them, so perhaps a one, two, three, four for each gun in the section or platoon, uh, but anything more than that doesn't seem to happen. Uh, sometimes you see those numbers painted on the water cans, the condenser cans, sometimes even ammunition boxes and spare parts cases as well. But as we say, other than this particular gun in the collection, it doesn't seem to have mattered. Now you can just see there the number four on the transit chest just behind it as well. And that's because that is transit chest number, uh, 
the transit chest in which gun number four came from Nepal. So we're really pleased to have that full matching set. Uh, we'll do a full video on the Nepalese gun, hopefully quite shortly. Uh, we're just having a little piece made up to be able to uh, demonstrate that fully. So another of the questions is how do you adjust the fusey spring? This dirty great spring on the side. Hopefully you know that if you're a firer, but this is this is something that you know, clearly has been asked. Um, why not use our skeletonized gun and also some of the instructional posters and have a little bit of product promotion because these are available for sale. Uh, also, if you sign up to Patreon as one of the uh, first class machine gunners, then you will uh, receive one of these posters, A3, as part of the benefits. Now, the pull of this Yuzi spring between seven and nine pounds, three half turns down, adds half a pound, three half turns up, takes off half a pound. What does that mean? So, we need to grab our spring balance, and also, hopefully, you've watched the blank firing attachment video, uh, and you'll see. We should be taking the lock out, but this is purely for demonstration, so what we're gonna do is lift that up and be able to read off Oh, we're not able to zoom in this camera very easily, but we're going to be able to read off what that says, and it says four pounds. Now, we run this, run our guns quite light so that they don't clack about, uh, but what we can do is to reduce that. Uh, so, so reduce that we take, we turn that up, and it's, what did it say, three half turns. So that's one, two, three, and hopefully you can see the screw coming out of the spring there, and if I do it the other way, down, one, two, and three, and that's what you'd be, be doing to adjust that fusy spring. Between seven and nine pounds for a service gun, so ball ammunition, we run it at between three and a half and four for our blank firing, so a lot lower, partly because that's new made blank, it's quite powerful. We wanna control the rate of fire quite closely. So we're able to control the rate of fire with the adjustment on the fusey spring now. Uh, and that clearly you know, ha has an impact on a lot of different things. Now, you can use the service pattern for, um, spring balance. Now this is actually a Lewis gun one with the screwdriver attachment. Um, the Vickers one just has a, a ball at both ends. You don't need the you don't need the punch. Um, it's quite useful to have a Lewis one to hand because you've got the extra functions of screwdriver and punch there. But you can also use uh, a modern uh, spring balance, like so, and it will show. So what's that showing? Five pounds, six pounds on there. Um, you just have to get used to what you're using. Check what you need, let's say, take the lock out uh, to make sure that there's reduced friction on there. This will be something we cover in the full Vickers Machine Gun training series if we get the funding to do those. You know, I seem to be talking about funding a lot, but we've got so many plans uh, that it'd be, uh, it'd be rude not to get the funding for them and share. So hopefully, let's say, that's how you adjust it using this little here. And we said three half turns down, adds half a pound, and three half turns up takes off half a, half a pound. So that's how you adjust that fusy spring. Now, last of the questions for today was how to lace the barrel casing cover. So often just referred to as the water jacket cover. And I just wanted to pull up the two examples we've got in the collection here. So we've got this uh, cross lacing system uh, on that one, and it's not dissimilar to how the Australian one is also done. Now that's because I've done them. So perhaps that's uh, just my habit. Um, obviously be aware that some of these are, uh, well, so these are, these are full of asbestos. Um, this is a reproduction one, so we, we, we do it, uh, yeah, we're able to use these, uh, but the Australian one is an original. So yeah, it seems to be laced crossways. Uh, there's a series of photos that I'll be putting up on the screen now that show different lacing systems as best we can see them from the Imperial War Museum photos and the Australian War Memorial. Sometimes they seem to be sort of ladder laced, like you do a pair of boots. Um, you know, nothing seems to be wrong, nothing seems to be right. Sometimes this excess string is <laughs> um, put up and down, and I think that's what you can see in some of the photos. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's a right or a wrong way. Some seem to be really offset, actually. Uh, so obviously just like, <laughs> Um, I think they're being done from, from one end, uh, through this hole, up to this hole, through this hole, up this hole, and it will gradually skew uh, the water jacket cover, uh, the, the barrel casing cover over time. Um, but 
you'll say there's, there's no particular problem uh, with any way of lacing them just make sure you've got the right one for the right circumstances so british australian british australian so there you go a series of questions answered that i hope have been of use to you uh let us know what other questions you have. Please sign up to our Patreon and let us know on there. Uh, we'll put, be putting a poll and a shout out uh, for any questions about anything to do with the Vickers machine gun. We'll do our best to answer them. If not, we'll take the time to research them and answer them for those of you that are patrons. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching. Please remember to like and share the video and subscribe to the channel. Please support us on Patreon if you're able to and let us know of anything you'd like to see in the future. I look forward to hearing from you.